Whether you like it or not, you're stuck with me if you're in things entertainment. And I'm going to be talking to you about the idea of what does ethics have to do with acting cybernetically. What does ethics have to do with it? Have to do with it? Would you like to come and see that? I just did. You may notice that I've got two screens. Yeah. All right. So this one is sort of for background. This is our interpretation of the Rosen model that Eli and I developed together. So please notice we have an actor who is contemplating the world, or what is presumed to be a complex world. And the actor has some problem that he or she wants to deal with. That problem has some perceived consequence in the world. And the question becomes, how do you model this? And how do you model it in a manner that works? So we have to select what things we're going to think about in the model. Then we have to think about doing some simulations, be they mental or something else. Look at potential actions that might get taken place. Having drawn that conclusion, you now select an action to implement, which has an intervention, which something happens in the world. You look at the consequences and you keep the cycle going. Please keep this model in mind while I'm talking. And the one key thing before I get started here, ethics is about choices. And if there's anything built into this model, it's, there's a lot of choices. You are thinking about what problem, you're thinking about what variables, you're thinking about what relationships, you're thinking about what to simulate. You're making a choice about what intervention to take. And then you're perceiving some consequences and doing it all over again. At every step along the way, there is choice. Ethics is about choice. Ethics demands self-awareness in agency. If we just act, if we go ahead and make choices without any awareness, it's hard to say that we're doing it in an ethical manner. Self-awareness is key to being able to decide that something is or is not happening in an ethical manner. Now, for much of what we do, we choose to assert simplifications. That's a choice. And one of the things that we often forget about when we're making the choice to simplify is that simplifications have consequences. Mm. The people of the United Kingdom have learned this one the hard way. Those simplifications and those choices raise some ethical concerns. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I'm sure you're all familiar with the notion of, if I can make this thing work, a sell-by date or a use-by date. This is an example that actually happened to me last week. I have a food service that sends me food once a week, and in the food that came a week ago, there was salmon. And on Saturday, I went to cook the salmon, and it clearly was labeled best before and Saturday's date. I opened it up and it was rotten. I picked up the phone, I called the people that sent me the salmon, and I was like, oh, you know, Getting me a refund was not the issue, but they wanted to inform me that it was my obligation to have understood that I should have cooked it a day earlier. Their simplification of enjoy before had an emphasis on the word before. Their CEO and I had a lengthy conversation this week, which Art was a witness to. They are changing the dates. <laughs> Simplifications can have consequences. Let's take another one. Everyone's heard of the Tesla. Most Teslas come with a feature called autopilot. Autopilot is not an autopilot. <laughs> it is an enhanced guidance system to augment your driving skills. But they call it autopilot. The studies of accidents involving Teslas and autopilots suggest that most of the problem lies in the label. The people that use it think it's an autopilot. Again, the simplification has a consequence. So we've got to start off with some simple basic principles. And the first one is we're human and humans are cognitively limited creatures. The good Lord did not give us the mental equipment to deal with the complex world in which we live. 
we are stuck. At most, we can deal with three to five unrelated things. You've all heard Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two. Most of the modern psychology research has indicated that it's actually three to five. But please note, there's an important word here, unrelated. And we're going to keep coming back to that. So you can store and deal with three to five unrelated things at the same time. Unfortunately, we do not live in a world that is adequately described by three to five unrelated variables. It just doesn't work that way. So as a result, we are stuck with creating our own reality, as everyone in this room knows, constructivism. We have to construct it because we don't have the equipment to deal with the world as it is. We are stuck with dealing with some aspects of that world. So we pick them. And having picked those aspects, we now construct the reality that we're going to deal with. So we filter the reality. There are steps that we take along the way. We limit our field of attention. We limit the factors that we're going to think about. We engage in some prediction, and we choose among those predictions, like coming back to that model over there. And in doing so, we come up with some simple simplifications or constructs. We prefer things to be simple. It's part of being human. We're not all that good with ambiguity. We find it fascinating, but it troubles us. Mm -hmm. Ambiguity is not simple. So where do we find the ambiguity? Part of it is in the words that we choose to use. Many of us speak to one another on an assumption that we understand what the other one means by the words. But the words may mean very different things to different people. I will come back to my example of the enjoy before. <clears throat> there is no way, as I said to the CEO, that 90 something percent of their customers understand that enjoy before means the day before. <laughs> Just not there. Ambiguity can also be found in our interpretations of the actions that we take. Something happens and we tell a story about it. But the story that I tell may be a different story than the story Klaus tells, or the story that Stuart tells, or the story that Ray tells. And in those differences we find more ambiguity. Ambiguity can result in ethical confusion. And let me give you an example. Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. Okay, uh, Susan, uh, where are you from? I'm from Blackpool, New York, Big West Morgan. That's a big town. It's a sort of collection of. It's a collection of. Uh, buildings. That's a big one. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. <laughs> episode from when it occurred a decade ago? Yes. The audience was laughing. Yeah. They had drawn some simple conclusions when this overweight 47-year-old lady came out with a very mm -hmm. sassy attitude. Well, cybernetics shows us that there might be another choice. There might be some other way that we can go about dealing with this. Cybernetics says is we have to question our assumptions. I agree with the average human analogy, you know, it's like, I know what it's like, but it's frustrating when you get criticized, when you think you're right, but somebody's getting in the way, you get frustrated, and then sometimes someone gives you a little bit of advice, and it opens the door, I think the door's just open to you. Hold on, I'm going to have to stop you there. Yeah, I'm going to have to stop you there. Yeah, I'm going to have to stop you there. Yeah, I'm going to have to stop you there. Hopefully, I'm about to open a door for you. We'll see. So, when cybernetics does this, we have a bunch of roots. Now, the roots that we're looking at are not only the ones from our greats, 
So I'm going to point to some other roots. Vygotsky, and that was a deliberate choice, not Piaget. Rorty, Wachinger, Husserl. Let me do the one at a time. So from Vygotsky, we learned that things are not necessarily pre-given. This is the difference with Piaget. We can learn from the context. The context affects how we learn. And there's a really great thing that Vygotsky does that he calls a complex. And I'd like to give you an example. So an example is, how does a child understand the notion of work? In the beginning, work is, I'll, I will try to be a little more politically correct than the example Vygotsky gives, work is when mommy or daddy or both leave the house. They say they're going to work. So all the child knows is that it's something outside of the house. That's the first concept. As the child gets older, it might be that mommy or daddy takes the child to their place of work. And now the child gets given another concept. Not only is it someplace outside of the house, but it's this particular place. And they keep, the child keeps hearing mommy or daddy leave to go to work. So work has also got some, some temporal dimension to it. And then the poor child ends up getting very confused the first time that mommy or daddy is working at home. Leave me alone, I'm working. Well, that's a whole other concept. What does that mean with regard to work? And then we get those really nasty things, our cell phones. And the child is even more confused. The parent is talking on the phone. Don't disturb me, I'm at work. You're at work? Vygotsky referred to the idea that all these things were lumped together in the notion of understanding what work was as a complex. And that we first learn complexes. And only later do we understand that context dependent, we learn to, how to unpack the complex and pick out the particular meaning. It's a very different way of explaining learning than what most of modern science says, or what Piaget says. But it's really important how we understand <clears throat> life. Now let's take Rorty, my favorite pragmatist. And this is the quote that everybody that's seen me speaks knows. I put this in everything. Knowledge is not a matter of getting reality right, but rather a matter of acquiring habits of action for coping with reality. And the emphasis here is on coping. Next group, Wachinger, the philosophy of as if. And I will submit that much of what we understand second order cybernetics to be stems from this, which was way before any of our groups. Wachinger says we cannot understand the world as it is, beyond our capabilities. But we would go insane if we didn't pretend that the world as we understand it is the world. So we are always dealing with the world, what we believe or project to be the as-if world. But we recognize, self-awareness again, that that as-if is subject to change. And it is in the recognition that it might change that I want to stress. And then finally, we've got Husserl with that nasty word that everybody talked to me I should never use again at a conference, but there it is, fundero. What's important about this word and this concept is it is the notion that there is something about the things we take for granted that allows us to take it for granted. When you are writing with a pen, you don't think about how the pen works unless you're a calligrapher. You are thinking about the writing you're doing with the pen. If you actually stop to think about how your car works, you probably would have a lot of trouble driving it. And as almost everybody that has an electric car knows, when they first came out, they had that lovely display that showed you how the electricity was flowing and how your car works. And every manufacturer quickly learned no one wanted to look at that. It was interfering with their ability to drive the car. 
we have some key principles that we need to be thinking about. The law of requisite variety, the concept of least action, and the idea that inside a black box there might be some white boxes yearning to get free. So, what is it about the law of requisite variety? This is going to be really critical when it comes to things like ethics. If you don't have a match between that which you're trying to control and the controller, you are welcoming ethical problems. The lack of requisiteness is an invitation for somebody or something to take a shortcut without asking the appropriate questions. And again, ethics lies in asking the questions. The least action principle says we're lazy, because we are. And what happens with us, very simply, is if we can find a way of doing something that requires less effort, that's usually what we will do. No, this is not an ironclad law. It's just a principle. And then finally, we have the observation of just because we deal with something as if it was a black box, where we don't know the mechanisms or they're not exposed to us, does not mean that those mechanisms and things that are not exposed don't have serious consequences. And it is worthwhile asking if the blackness of the black box that we're taking for granted needs to stay that way. Or should we be trying to open the box up? Should we be trying to examine what is going on? So now we come to that model that I've got over on the other screen. And I've already walked you through it, so we don't have to do it again. This model depends on all the things that I just cited as roots. And if cybernetics has anything to say about ethics, it's the idea that in order to arrive at ethical behavior and ethical actions, you've got to actually understand that every time you were doing something, you're going through some aspect of this model. Awareness comes from questioning the foundational assumptions, the taking for grantedness, that horrible word for theorem, and the context that allow us to assert that a simplification is a valid simplification. If we just accept the simplifications as given or pre-given, we're not engaged in ethics. The ethics comes from questioning and from developing a self-awareness that we have to ask the question. Now, what are some of those questions? So there, are we looking at the right things? Do we know what the limitations are of what we think? Do we actually have sufficient self-awareness? Are we using the right words or the right models to express it in a manner that the others who have to deal with it can accept and understand? So, let's go to another example. What are you going to say? Hey, why is it right now? Oh, you're going to do a great practice. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, you sure? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. The I really don't. We really like you, but that was terrible. Mm -hmm. You were going to say, Aretha, you got out of great track. I'm just wondering whether we should just do a verse and a chorus, maybe a cappella? Um. You're smarter. Uh, yeah. Come here, come here. Andy, I haven't had any of this. Okay. 
have a word. No, don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. Snowden over the years has seen some variety of this. And I would like to point out that what goes on and what went on in that little episode can be analyzed from this perspective, and it helps us reveal where some of the ethical questions come up. So the Kinevin model says that the world actually has several different ways of being looked at. There's the known part of the world where cause and effect are understood and predictable. You could refer to that as simple. There's the knowable part of the world, where with data and with analysis, we can figure out what's going on. We can refer to that as complicated. Then there's the complex part of the world, where there's interweavings instead of things being folded up together. So we can figure out after the fact what's been going on. And our job is to try to discern pattern and what the weavings might be. And I'm going to remind you, the root of complicated is plick, which is to fold. So when you're dealing with complicated things, you unfold them till you get to the right surface. But the root of complex is plex, which is to weave. And you cannot deal with the complex by unweaving it. If you do, you destroy it. So you have to come up with a different way of dealing with it. And then we've got that other little region down here, which is chaos. Now, what happens? Well, we tend to speak as if, the Wahinger thing again, we're dealing most of the time in the simple or known part of the world. We think that the use of labels and categories is sufficient. And that's how we go about talking usually with one another. But as poor Ansley understood, sometimes the world doesn't just give you a simple situation. So what happens is that we encounter one of the other three. We're dealing with the complex, the complicated, or the chaotic. And we have to find a way of sorting out what it is that's going on. Now, how do we do that? Well, science and the modernism project suggest that if you look at the knowable, the complicated part, you do enough statistical analysis, enough bell curve assertions and things like that, you can reduce the knowable down to the known. So with analysis, we can get back to the simple. When we do it, we don't tend to ask how it is we went about simplifying. I'm assuming people are noticing the irony in the slide. <laughs> All right, so let's take an example from what we just saw. Ansley, Ansley, sorry mate. I don't think this backing track was working for you. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible backing track. 
so I don't think we can judge you properly on this. We really learned. <coughs> we really like you. That, that was terrible. Now, what the audience heard and what Ansley heard was that was terrible. The simplification was forget it. As we all know, because we saw what happened next, that isn't what happened next. But that was the simplification that anybody would have heard. Because we're stuck simplifying, yet dealing with the complex, we've got to go through these procedures to try to figure out what works. So how do we do it? I'm just wondering whether we should just do a verse and a chorus, maybe a cappella? Um. She had no idea what to do with that. My best guess is that she's never sung a cappella except in the bathroom. She was now being asked to do it in front of 5,000 people and on live TV. She was someplace in this chaotic realm, and she didn't have the advantage of the simple or the complicated in order to figure out what to do. She just had to act. Of course, what ended up happening is that we needed to find a way to get from here and here over to something simple so that she could deal with it. Well, turns out that Kinevin was related to something referred to as Ashby space. And when Dave Snowden was developing this, law, Ross Ashby's law of recognition played a major role. So if you can't see it, at the top we've got the chaotic realm, complex in the middle, ordered, which is both complicated and simple down below, and then nice 45 degree line for records and variety. What we learn is if you're starting someplace up here in this pink, you've got to move down on the 45 degree line and you've got a problem. Well, it turns out there's a couple of ways to go. You could tell a story. Or you could do statistics and labels. Please notice, this one gets you to a much higher point on the line than this one. From the perspective of what's going on, you can tell a narrative, or we can start employing constraints, boundaries, things that allow us to do the labeling and the category making. There's a lot more room in the narrative. Narratives cross boundaries and constraints, as you will see. Have you? I haven't met any of this. It's my memory wall as well. It's a special wall. Okay. 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 Okay.